of FDG Entertainment. He co-founded a gaming company when he was 19, and right now they have a pretty impressive portfolio of games like Banana Kong, Cover Orange, and others. And he's going to tell us about designing endless runners. No, oh, thanks, Alex. So um, this year, beginning of this year, we released uh, Banana Kong, was, which was pretty successful. And um, first, let's check out what Banana Kong is. So it's an endless runner. You play a gorilla that's running away from a banana avalanche. And um, there are four different layers of locations that are running in parallel. And you can switch between them with the gameplay elements. Um, it has very cartoony graphics. It launched as a paid game and s successfully switched to a free game. And so far, it did more than 10 million downloads. Um, still growing. So how did it all start? Um, we wanted to do uh, something new in the endless runner genre, because we've seen this genre is very popular, and we liked it pretty much. And um, we felt that in the beginning of 2011, at the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, there was still something missing in the genre, and we wanted to take a more classic jump and run approach and um, do something new. Well, the problem at this time was that there were so many endless runners already, like Jetpack Joyride, uh, Ski Safari, and many others, which were very successful. Everyone was unique. and had a very cool idea, and so it was pretty tough to find something new. So we definitely did, didn't want to clone and really do something new. And uh, unfortunately, unlike Tassius and his team, we couldn't rely on a successful brand. So we had to create something from scratch. And um, the solution for us was to give users and potential players something that they're longing for. It's, they, they know from other platforms, but that they can't find on iOS so far, on, on mobile. Um, so we gave them that and combined it with cool new mechanics, that basically the, the unique twist that Tessus also mentioned earlier. Um, so for us, it worked very well to combine different gameplay areas that run in parallel, where you can switch basically seamlessly between each others. So the first, the main one is the jungle. And every once in a while, like lianas appear. You can switch to the treetops. And the, um, the cave, for example, it's uh, also a bonus section. You can enter it by going to a cave entrance, same as the underwater section. Um, you always require a dash to do that. So the dash bar gets full by collecting bananas. And so that's basically one of the core elements of the game. And um, as soon as we had this idea of different gameplay sections where you can switch between each other, um, thought, yeah, that's something cool. And we need to do something like this. So how did the development start? As uh, some people may know, we don't have internal development resources. We have everything except programmers and graphic artists. Um, we have lots of people. We work for ages together, but no developers sitting in-house. Um, so during the concept phase, when our game already has some really good ideas and everything looked quite concrete, we were searching for a developer. Um, Gamaga pitched a game to us, which was Bunny Flex 2. It was a very nice game. Great art, but it was a flash game played with mouse and keyboard and didn't translate so well to touch screens. So we said, hey, let's turn the reel around. We will pitch them Banana Kong. So we told them of our idea. They liked it. And a couple of weeks afterwards, we started working on Banana Kong. So one of the first things we did was the character design of Banana Kong himself. Um, we wanted to go with something very cartoony, so we did lots of tests, and this is really important in character design. This was the very first sketch, and so it's a totally different style, but a bit too childish, and the style evolved, and we searched for references, checked out many cartoons and comics, and 
So the character evolved and got more and more personality and grew and on until we finally come up with this, which was one of the first mockups for the final version of Banana Kong. And it's always very important to make as many sketches as possible, also in different moods and different expressions, because you never know what you will need that for. And also it's very important to get the, um, the character of the character done right. And so this is what he ended up to be. This is the main character, but as important as main characters or secondary characters as well. So for example, the toucan, you can see the final version in the bottom right of the slide. And this was one of the first character sheets as well from the toucan. It looked totally different. And it took quite a few tries to get the style nailed down. So you can see it's different styles and like funny situations like here. Never appeared in a game, but it's very important to do them during development, to play with the character and you get a feeling for it. Um, this is how the token looks in a game in the end. Same goes for the locations and actual gameplay. Um, one of the first ideas we had were including hills. And <coughs> I'm sorry, there's an air condition right behind me. It's killing me. <coughs> um, so yeah, we wanted to include hills, um, but we weren't sure if it works. Um, back in last year, there was still this 50 megabyte limit on, on the Apple Store. And we came to, to the point where, had, where we had to do the trade-off. Well, do we include hills where we don't really know if it works well? And, Except Sonic, not many classic jump runs have hills or, like, well, not straight lines or platforms. So we decided not to go with that, but rather use other elements. So a couple of weeks later, the first challenges appeared, especially with the controls. Because basically, we need four types of controls yeah, it's jump, glide when you jump to go down slower. The dash, to dash through objects or get faster. And jump down from platforms or when you're mid-air, to dash down faster. <coughs> Sorry. Well, so what do you do with all these controls? One of the approaches could be buttons. But where to put all the buttons? And you need at least three buttons and we came to the conclusion that no, buttons are not the solution because they're not intuitive controls. You can iOS devices or Android devices or all touchscreen devices often use gesture controls or whatever to control the, the OS. So it basically go, totally goes against what the touchscreen devices are nowadays. So this is this was something that's really important for us and develop in almost every game that we really make the best use of the touchscreen itself. Also, parts of the gameplay area are hidden in an in in endless runner where scrolling gets very fast after some time. You hide um, big parts of the area at the right where elements are coming. Well, basically, you, you shorten the reaction time and people can get frustrated and so Many reasons not to do that. Um, also, players are forced to press always the same spots. And well, if they want to hold it differently, then well, well it gets tiring in some games to play with buttons. Another approach was dividing the screen on touch-sensitive areas. Or on the right, for example, you could dash. And to the left, already, we need to divide the screen into two parts. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and well, there are also some downsides, even though that these controls are better. It works very well if you just have two types of controls. But if you have four types, like we do, well, we can unify two controls to one. So we still have three different controls. That, well, your fingers have to travel a long distance, and it's just really cumbersome to control. Um, 
basically didn't make any fun. Also, and you have to consider this and keep that in mind. You restrict yourself in, in game design because if you have, to, if you want to stick to this control, you cannot add anything new. If you go with gesture controls, for example, you can always make a new type of swipe or draw a line or touch with two fingers or whatever. You can be creative, but if you decide to divide the screen into touch sensitive areas, well, um, you're pretty much screwed. And what about left-handed people? Well, you need to add an option as well to flip the screen controls and so on. So for us, definitely the solution was to use gesture controls. And these are just tap for jumping. If you stay tapped, you glide. If you swipe to the right, you dash. If you swipe downwards, well, you jump down platforms or dash down mid-air. And this is what we found out worked best. People understood it often without having a tutorial because it's just the natural, most natural motions. And it's everyday gestures. People are used to, to control their devices like this. And the screen is not cluttered. It's very clear. You have less buttons on the screen. And also, it's very flexible for the future. You have three different well, touch controls, but we can still add a two-finger swipe or two-finger tap if at some point we want to do new controls. But there's one essential con um, problem coming with this type of controls. All four controls start with a tap. So how could we do the difference and tell the difference between all these controls. Well, you basically had to find the right timing and make sure that there's no delay between if you just make a tap or if you swipe to the right or swipe downwards. Um, so we had to do a huge amount of tests with different timings and settings and give it to lots of friends and people to play and get their feedback. And we also had to observe them and see what they say, and if they say, mm, yeah, well, that's OK. And if somebody replies like that to you, like, how do you like it? And say, yeah, yeah, it's OK. Well, then, then you should ask, OK, if it's just OK, then there is something that could be better. So what is it? And you really have to dig and dig and dig. And then if you know what's wrong, you have to tweak until it's really, really good. And this is what took a long time on BananaCon. But in the end, become really cool. Another challenge was the level design. Well, it's, it was the first endless runner we did. So <coughs> endless runners are potentially played a hundred times and thousand times. And every time you play the game, it should be a new experience. So how should you create enough variation to make sure that level works and all this randomization stuff is cool. So our first approach was um, total randomness. And unfortunately, it leads to frustrating situations that are not solvable, like you cannot pick up bananas, or like then eventually you have huge gaps that you cannot get across. So basically, this is an absolute no goal. Um, there's no control on difficulty, no control on design, and fun, and well, never ever do a game completely random as long as it's some, I don't know, special in the 64K demo or whatever. But if you want to make a real fun game that also monetizes, you have to be prepared and do all the things you want to do really plan. So we did something called planned randomness. Um, so we, we built small sections of levels, and we randomly arranged them. Um, <coughs> these, so like this, we could make sure that every section has a nice design and um, some, some small challenges, and make sure that they are fun. And these sections make sure that we could create this classic jump and run feeling that we know from games in the 80s or in the 90s, for example. So really, the, you have to control the game. Even if the game has a big amount of random elements, 
you can fake this feeling of randomness. And no, basically, nobody noticed that the game is set up from small situations and s gameplay sections. So it works pretty well. So then you're ready for release. Well, you should make that. You make sure you should make sure that you're not project blind. After half a year or a year of development, well, you start to get s so much used to certain things that are not really cool in the game. But after some time, like cumbersome controls, for example, you think, "Oh man, that's so cool!" And you give it people to play, and they think, "Ah." Okay, uh, that's like totally awkward. What what's this supposed to be? Yeah, well, that's this cool feature. And it's no, that's not cool. So, really listen to what people are saying, and um, also make sure that people understand your game. Now, Banana Kong is a pretty simple game, um, but the first tutorial we had, it didn't work out so well, and um, like we didn't restrict the the player's actions. So we just told, yeah, okay, now tap, now swipe, now do this, and okay, let's go. Um, people were just clicking, 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 and then the tutorial was over, and it was like, okay, what do I have to do? Ah, come on, you just played the tutorial. Then we did ma many, many tweaks and analysis and stuff. Um, um, what we did in the tutorial then is we taught people one action at a time and restricted the uh, input to one type, which is only the correct type. For example, if it says you have to tap, then only the tap works, and you have to do it three times. And only then the next tutorial step comes. And this worked pretty well, and after this tutorial, nobody asked anymore, OK, what, how do I control the game? And also basically comes down to what I said a little bit earlier. If people don't like a feature, if you show the game to 20, 30 people, or even more, and a huge amount of them says that's not cool, and probably it's not cool, and you really went project blind. And you s have to think twice about this, because if, if 25 from 30 people don't like something, the potential is high that if you put them on the store, that thousands, millions, or how many, I don't know how many people don't like this feature as well. And I hope this is obvious, but it happens often as well. Don't include ma known major bugs in your game. If you think, oh, okay, this, this bug is so hidden, nobody will come across it, well, be sure people will come across this bug and many other bugs that you didn't know. So the game is released. What's next? Well, there will always be ambitious players about your game that really love it and want to get in somehow into the, into the development of the game as well by contributing ideas or suggestions. Um, make sure to listen to them because this will pay off. If like five people send you an email and say, hey, why don't you add feature X, Y, Z, then you should really consider it because if you do, these five people will recommend the game further and say, ah, oh, that's so cool, and I suggested this feature, and yeah, they did it, and look how it plays now. Um, so this also adds um, some dimension of virality. Also, updates keep games alive. So if you look at most game cycles, or li game life cycles mm, on mobile, for example, they, they spike at the release and goes down, then there's another update, and goes down again, update, and goes on like this. So be sure to make cool updates that people really enjoy and that add something cool to the game. Um, basically, this is my favorite part about creating games nowadays. It's that we create a dynamic product. Unlike 20 years ago, where games were sold on cartridges, we can update games, we can patch them, we can add new functionality. And this is really cool nowadays. because. You can see what people like, what they don't, um, can really work well on it. So the first thing was um, the character customiza customization. We got so many people that asked, oh my god, I have so many bananas, I want to spend them on something, and can I not customize Banana Kong somehow? Well, keeping in mind that there was still this 50 megabyte restriction back then, we had to think what we could do, because we couldn't add 
clothes and stuff because we would have need a huge amount of animations for that. So in the end, well, there were these um, parachutes anyway we needed for gliding. So we thought, OK, maybe we can replace them easily. It's just one, one small graphic, and we can include many of them and without making the game too big. This worked out pretty well. And same for the hats. Like the hat, it's only a layer that's put above the animation. And it worked out pretty well. And people were very, very happy that they couldn't spend more bananas that they earned in a gameplay and customize the character. This also creates a more emotional bond to the character if they can customize it and make them look the way they want. Another part of the dynamic product is really add new gameplay content. And we did this with the underwater section, which wasn't in the released version, in the first release. Um, so basically, there was a whole new gameplay dimension. Uh, we replaced uh, the banana avalanche by the crocodile that people already knew from the jungle section. But now it's underwater, it's the crocodile that's hunting. Banana Kong, and we also introduced a new character <coughs> that Banana Kong could ride, and it's basically like a vehicle, and it all adds a very new dimension of gameplay. You should also think about customizing your logo for updates. This is the logo of the first version, and for the update, we replaced the characters with the underwater animals. People know people immediately rec recognize the, char the characters and especially the logo, but they also know, ah, there is something new in the game. So this is also a great way to tell people there is something new. And people desperately wanted some social elements and play again against their friends. And Game Center offers really nice possibilities to integrate all this sharing and data stuff. <coughs> and so here, for example, you see how far your friend has come. And it's always a co cool feeling to see, ah, OK, uh, I'll beat you. <laughs> I'll beat another one. And it's also a motivation to play and play and keep playing. So times are changing, and so are games. The market is heavily shifting towards free to play. And games market, uh, paid games market is getting smaller and smaller. Um, so this is something to take into account when developing games. We didn't have free-to-play in mind when we launched Banana Kong. Um, the very good sales, we did more than 500k sales in six months, which was very good at the beginning of the year for, for paid games. Now it's even harder to get these numbers. And um, Well, nevertheless, we tried to, f uh, to switch the game to free in August this year. And it went so well that we decided to stay free and make a really free-to-play targeted content update in September. And what we did then was adding a new shop where you could buy permanent perks like uh, um, Mega Sale, for example, which halves all prices in the shop, or lucky, the Lucky Charm, where you can basically survive one hit in the game or the classic currency doubler, which is the golden banana. And l people, surprisingly, really like to pay like these real price tags on games. We're pretty much surprised about this as well some, to some extent. But it works very well. And somehow it's more honest than, doing, than going the, the way through virtual currency and charging. I don't know how many bananas or whatever, or gems, because <coughs> people just know, OK, this feature cost me two euros. Yeah, I like the game. I'll do it. Uh, they know what they paid. They know what they get. Um, we also added another hard premium currency you can only get for money. It's the golden hearts that are used for rewife. And the golden hearts basically are the best selling in a purchase, because they can keep people playing longer, and people are ready to play for that. So thanks a lot for listening, and that's it.
Uh, did you want to give out some yeah, something? Sure. You um, have t-shirts, right? I have t-shirts with me from a couple of our games, so if you guys have okay, questions... Okay, so uh, we're going to do questions for. until you run out of t-shirts. Is that fair? Sorry? We're going to do questions until you run out of t-shirts. Okay. So like four-ish? Yeah, something like this. Okay, so uh, we have first question over here. Здравствуйте, меня интересует, какие больше всего обновления люди приветствуют в играх лучше? Это персонажи, это уровни какие-то, это какие-то айтемы могут быть. The question is, what type of updates do people receive best? So like characters, new items, etc. What's your view on that? Well, the, the best thing you could do is always do a, a full content update. Basically, if, if you really add new gameplay, yeah, the, there are different ones. Like, so if you, if you add new gameplay elements, that's what people like best. Or if they ask for a feature, like the feature they ask for. In, in our case, for example, customization. Man, many people ask for customization. When we added this, it was, they were very happy about that. Uh, hello. Hi. Can you explain why had you switched to free to play? Well, the whole market is switching to free to play, and um, like all the endless runners, or most of them are free to play as well. And we wanted to see how Banana Kong works in, in free to play as well. And we were very surprised that it works well, even better. Like the the revenue was higher after the free-to-play switch than before, which was very surprising because the game was actually not designed or balanced to be free-to-play. Um, uh. Okay, we have a question right there. Игорь, Apps Ministry, I want to ask you, what events you put your statistics? That is, what kind of interesting hooks, not standard, like I clicked on the button or I played for 30 seconds, what kind of Действительно интересные, важные ивенты. Вот в Endless Runner в своем вы используете. The question is about in-game analytics. Yeah. So, um, what kind of events do you think are the most interesting to track in, for example, an Endless Runner? Not like buttons or like Star Game, but maybe there's some sort of secret that you guys uh, look at in stats and go like, oh, th this is uh, this is uh, making this game really great. Well, I think it totally depends on the game, like on the gameplay elements and stuff, but it's certainly reasonable to track how far people come. Like it's better to track this in, in sections of, of meters, for example, how many people come from 100 to 200 meters, 200 to 500, well, stuff like this. Uh, what items they use f for every run, for example, and stuff like this. But it's, it's not interesting to track how many times people push the option button. Doesn't make sense. We, we so did you, this in you the have to be smart about it, basically. Right? Yeah, that's you. You have well, it takes some time, and there's no, no like golden rule for for metrics. But I think the guys from Flurry or Contagion or whatever they can really help you with that. Okay, uh, we have time just for one last question over here in the first row. Hi. Hi. Philip, can uh, as I see, uh, beta testing is very important stage yeah. in development. Uh, can you describe maybe three main issues of this process in your company? You mean when, when we test? Uh, or? Like stages, first, second, third. But about beta testing. Well, basically, you, sh you should start you should start testing as early as possible. Like if you have, as soon as you have the first prototype that works, show it to as many people as you can to to get feedback of the features are really fun. Uh, well, obviously, you will not search for, for bugs at this stage. So basically, every stage of development has its own type of testing. And only at the very final stage, you, you don't look at, at, at the fun anymore, but really try to find all the issues in the game. And you have to start doing things that you're not supposed to do, basically. And, Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, please give a round of applause to Philip Doschel, and we're going to continue. Thanks.